Hey everybody, Peter Katz here, and I wanted to make some videos for all of you event professionals who are dealing with some of the challenges of making your events virtual. And specifically, I wanna talk about working with virtual speakers and entertainers. And for this video, I wanna talk about some of the tech considerations, as well as some of the risk management when it comes to dealing with somebody who's not in your physical event space. So I've come up with five considerations to think about. First things first, just to cover some of the basics, you probably already know these things, but just in case, make sure your speaker has a hardwired internet connection. It's a $20 ethernet cable, maybe a little adapter if they need it, much more reliable connection. Next, make sure they tell everybody in the household, okay, during these hours, no Fortnite, no Netflix, I need the bandwidth. And when it comes to bandwidth, encourage your speaker to use something like speedtest.net. It's a totally free service and they can find out what their upload and download speeds are. And if they're not adequate, then they can either try to upgrade their internet or get themselves to a location where they can have that reliable upload and download speeds. Just to give you a benchmark, bare minimum, 2.5 megabytes per second upload download five megabytes per second, bare minimum, if they're broadcasting in HD, but really you wanna be above that. I would say minimum 10 megabytes per second. And of course you can get up in the hundreds of megabytes per second and have much more reliable internet. Second consideration is make sure your speaker has some kind of contingency plan in place in case any part of their system goes down. And I break it into four subsystems. So you have the visual element, which is the camera. You have the audio element, which is the microphone. You have the broadcasting element, which is the computer. And then you have the internet. And for each of those subsystems, you wanna have two options in place. And you want one of those two options to be battery powered in case there's a power failure. So for example, for my camera, I have camera number one, but then I have camera number two in case camera number one goes down. They're both plugged in, but they also both have batteries in them. Secondly, I have my microphone. It's running into a mixer, but then I have a secondary mixer that's battery powered. In case anything goes wrong, I can flip over. Then I have my main desktop that I use, but I have a laptop right next to it in case there's a power failure, in case anything goes wrong, switch a couple wires, I'm good to go. Lastly, when it comes to the internet, you might not know this, but you can buy a battery for 25 bucks that you put in the back of your modem. And even if there's a power failure, you can have the internet for up to four hours. Pretty cool. Now, I recognize not everybody is gonna have this in depth of a setup and that's okay, you don't need it, but take the same concepts and scale them back, okay? So let's say you're just using a laptop and the webcam. What's the contingency plan in case anything happens with the laptop? Well, how about this? What if you had a phone on a tripod with all of the notifications disabled and the link for the Zoom meeting or whatever it is ready to go so in case anything happens with the laptop, switch over, hit the button, and you could be back in action in no time. So with each of those components, be thinking about redundancies so that if anything goes wrong, you can finish what you started. Third consideration is practice your fire drills. What I mean by that is it's well and good to have contingency plans in place. It's a whole other thing to do it in the moment. So practice. As part of your tech check, you can actually run those fire drills. So, oh no, the laptop went down. Okay, I'm switching over to the phone, making sure the tripod is in the right place, making sure the right button is queued up, the notifications are off, boom, easy peasy. Oh no, the computer went down, no problem. It's just these two wires, I'm in on the laptop, I'm back up and running. And you, as the event professional, you know, you can practice your dance moves. So if you got to jump in for 30 seconds, you'll have your dance moves, but you won't be there for too long because they're going to be back up and running because you've run your fire drills. Fourth consideration is that all important tech check. And my recommendation is to do that at least one week before the event. And I say at least a week because things might come up where you're going to need to figure out some workarounds or your speaker is going to need to figure out some workarounds. For example, I actually gave a talk this morning and the platform that they were using would not interface with this switching software that I use to seamlessly show my slides. So I had to figure something out. So it was no problem. I figured I could screen share and use a PDF and programmed a couple hotkeys on my keyboard and it was all okay. But I was grateful to have that buffer to figure out how to do that and to be able to practice so that I could do it smoothly in the moment. Fifth and final consideration is the day of tech check and I recommend doing that one hour before the presentation. And I say one hour for a couple reasons. 
First of all, if anything is wrong, an hour is enough time to figure it out. Second of all is lighting. A lot of your presenters will likely be dealing with natural light and you want to be close enough to show time that the lighting hasn't changed dramatically between the time that you checked and the time that you present it. Now, within the actual tech check, there's a few things that you want to do. One, make sure they're running through every possible look. So if they have multiple cameras or overlays or all these different variables, run all those things, make sure everything is working as planned. If they have slides, run through every slide, make sure it's all running smoothly. When it comes to the audio, have them do their loudest thing, their quietest thing, make sure they're not clipping, make sure they can be heard and everything is sounding the way that they want it to sound. A couple of other suggestions is I would highly encourage your speakers to do their own tech check before they show up to yours. So with all the different platforms out there, it's easy enough to self-record, make sure it's all looking good before they show up. Lastly, sometimes the room is in use right before your speaker is supposed to speak because there's another speaker or the audience is already there. So I recommend that you set up a secondary room to run some of your sound checks if need be. They can log in, they can problem solve if they need, and it's not dependent on, oh no, the guests are coming in, there's time to figure things out, and then they should be good to go when they come into the main room. And you can check them one last quick time before they go live. With all of these considerations in place, I trust that you and the presenters that you're bringing in for your events are gonna be able to create an amazing and reliable experience for your audience. I've been able to reach over 25,000 people virtually so far since the start of this whole thing. And even though it's different, I've been so heartened by the impact that can still be created with the right planning in place. If you'd like to find out about what I can offer your events, of course, petercatspeaks.com is a great place for all that information. But from my heart, thank you for doing what you're doing. I just want to remind you that the work that you're doing is really important. People need events. They need moments of coming together. They need moments of connection. So thank you for doing the hard work of trying to figure out how to offer that to them in the virtual space. From my heart, thanks again. More content coming soon. And until then, I'll see you in the virtual space.